Hi, I'm Andrew Ward, pastor at Community Baptist Church, and we're excited to have you join us for this service. Hey, if you're in the Flagler County area and you don't have a church home, we wanna invite you to come join us. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 1030 for our worship service, and then we have a midweek fill-up service on Wednesdays at 645. I pray that today's message is a blessing. God bless. All right, I wanna encourage you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter eight. If you didn't bring a copy of God's Word with you in the chair in front of you, you should find a Bible there. Romans chapter 8, we continue on our study through the book of Romans. Can the Bible give us practical help to endure suffering? I'm not talking about cliche answers or trite sayings. Those things might be okay if you're faced with the everyday annoyances of life, but what about when you're in a sea of painful, intense, prolonged suffering? Can the Bible give practical help there? Jesus told us that in this world we would have trouble, and many people know that all too well. The grief that comes with the loss of a loved one, the uncertainty and helplessness felt when there's a financial or health or a family problem. And we can move on from there because our problems don't end in our personal life. We look at this world in which we live in. It seems to be on a collision course with destruction, wars, and political upheaval. Many people are suffering greatly over the degradation of the culture and the immorality that has no boundaries. I think there are many people that cry out, this is not the world that I grew up in. What's going on? So getting back to our question, can the Bible give us practical help to endure suffering? Now I think this is where God's word, once again, is set apart from the answers that people come up with, because God alone offers help that He personally gives. This passage that we're studying today, God offers us a prescription for strength in the midst of suffering. I think this is an important passage of Scripture for us to understand what does God teach us about how we respond to suffering. God offers us very practical help, and I believe that understanding this is going to provide comfort and a guide in the dark and painful days of suffering. So with that, let's continue on our study in Romans chapter 8. We'll pick up in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I suppose that every person that's listening is well acquainted with suffering. Some of us, obviously, much more than others. But it is a common thread that runs through humanity in this fallen world. And God, I praise You and I thank You for the reality that we do not have to endure this alone. That we are not left to our own devices to get ourselves through suffering. But You have promised the believer that You will never leave us and never forsake us. Holy Spirit, I ask that in this time as we study Your Word that You would minister to each person in this room. Help us to see clearly what Your Word has to say to us 
and how it applies to our life. Certainly, Lord, we recognize, as has already been noted, in this world we're going to have trouble. But didn't our Lord also say to take heart because He has overcome this world? Show us, Lord, how to practically live in light of that truth. And as we do, may you be glorified. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we continue on our study here through the book of Romans, this section specifically that we're in right now, uh, chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 8, uh, verses 18 down through 25. I stopped reading at 22 this morning, but one unit of thought is 18 through 25. This is the second week in that study, but I think it would be helpful just to go back and reset the stage. Where have we come from? Uh, getting uh, just a f- refreshing of um, where we are in the flow of thought in the book of Romans. We've been in this now uh, for several months. This is the 42nd message on the book of Romans. Uh, I was heartened. I, I listened to a, a brother that I admire, a fellow preacher. He said it took him 160 messages to get through the book of Romans. We may do it in 80, I'm not sure. We'll see. There's so much packed into this this wonderful uh, book. It begins all, uh, really there are six sections. You could divide Romans up into six sections. We're in the third of those sections. The first section, it's really the introduction to the book of Romans. And then the theme of the book I suggested to you is laid out there for us in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And And the theme of the book of Romans, the gospel is the power of God for salvation resulting in righteousness. Everything that Paul says in the book of Romans really kind of hangs on that that theme. And so you see that introductory portion of Romans from Romans 1 uh, verses 1 through 17. And then you come into a rather large section, the second section, uh, title that, The Gospel Proclaimed. That's uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, down to Romans chapter 5, verse 21. And this is where Paul lays out systematically, almost as if a prosecuting attorney lays out for us the gospel, beginning from Romans 1, 18, down to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, laying out the fact that we are all sinners, establishing very clearly we are in desperate need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a problem. We have rebelled against a holy God who knows everything that we've ever thought, said, or done, and the wages of sin is death. All of us are, are, are separated from God because of our sin and in this hopeless and helpless position. And it's, it's right there uh, that Paul in, begins to introduce in Romans 3.21 uh, what it is that Jesus Christ has done. That God has sent His own Son who died on a cross, sacrificed His life to pay the penalty for sin. And now, because of what Jesus has done, we can be saved. And you continue on in that section all the way up to chapter 5. Verse 21, Paul is telling us uh, that, that the way that we are saved or justified, the way that we are made right with God is by faith alone in what Christ has done. There's nothing that we can do to merit eternal life. There's nothing that we can do to, to merit the righteousness that God requires. We receive it by faith alone in Christ alone. So there in that section, we see the gospel is proclaimed. The third third section we're in right now, I title that, uh, the gospel is lived out. This is Romans 6, 7, and 8. It's all about sanctification. We came to chapter 8, and I suggested that we might title chapter 8, Your New Life in Christ. Paul's talking about sanctification, and he opens up there. In verse 1, telling us that there is no condemnation. In Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation because of what Christ has done. And then continuing on, Paul uh, continues to elaborate this idea of sanctification or growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us in verses 2 through 13 that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And because of this, you can obey God. If you're a Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables, equips, empowers you to to obey God. What's more, Paul continues on here thinking about this theme of sanctification, growing in Christ, or the gospel lived out. Beginning with verse 14, Paul talks about our adoption. 
It just keeps getting better, doesn't it? The fact that we are, we are actually adopted into the family of God. Another underlying theme that you see, by the way, throughout Romans chapter 8 is this idea of security. We're going to see that developed even more in the, the coming weeks. This idea that what God has given to us in Christ is secure. If you are a Christian, if you have repented of your sin and believed Jesus, you can know that all of these things are true. That there is no condemnation upon you for sins in the past or sins in the present or sins even in the future. And that you are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what's more, you can have security knowing that you are Adopted. Your child, a son or a daughter of God, certainly His promise to never leave us and never forsake us can be, can be taken as truth. Then Paul wraps up that section, and that's what transitions us into where we are this morning. There, look with me at verse 17. He says, If children, heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That's good news, isn't it? Fellow heirs with Christ. Now, here, here's the transition. If indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. That's, that's the part that brought us into this section here, verses 18 through 25. Paul's now elaborating on this statement that he makes about suffering. And he needs to, doesn't he? He's been talking about the, uh, the, 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 the fact that we are saved, justified because of Christ and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then almost as if out of nowhere, he's talking about suffering. Paul, what's going on? Now, suffering is a difficult reality and it's something that brings up a question. Paul knows it. it's going to bring up a question. That's the reason he's dealing with this. I mean, if we're children of God, if we've been redeemed by God, if, if our hope in heaven is secure, why would we have to deal with suffering? What's this talk about suffering? Shouldn't we just live our best life now? Shouldn't we just have uh, everything that we want, be healthy, wealthy, and wise? Isn't that the way that this is supposed to work? Paul's going to deal with this, this idea of suffering, because we recognize, again, in this world, we, we do have trouble. But God does not leave us without hope. He gives us hope in Christ. And in this passage of Scripture, He's going to give us a prescription to endure suffering. Now, the last time we studied Romans, we saw that there are at least two reasons why Christians suffer. The first of which, we live in a fallen world. Because of the sin that is in this world, this is not what God intended. Because of the sin that is in this world, there's suffering. It's a part of life. And then second, we also saw another reason unique or distinctive to Christians is the fact that this world hates our Lord. And because of that, all who follow Him are hated as well. So this, quite frankly, is part of our new life in Christ. It's a part of, of, of being a, a follower of Jesus Christ. We live in a fallen world that endures suffering and we follow a Savior that the world hates. And so certainly it shouldn't surprise us that the world would hate us as well. And because of that, we endure suffering. Now, this section God is giving us here in verses 18 through 25, I believe three keys to help us to endure and even grow in Christ in the midst of suffering. Two weeks ago, when we looked at verse 18, the theme there is this idea we need to accept the fact that there is suffering in this world. And, and, and maybe that you think at first glance goes without saying, but I don't think that it does. We don't like suffering, and there's nothing wrong with that. No one should want to suffer in this world and in thinking about this concept of suffering in the abstract, it's easy to say, well, yeah, we just need to accept that suffering is real, but what happens when it comes into your life? What happens when it comes into your family? 
when it's your child, your relative, when it's something that happens to you, it's very personal, very intimate. But we need to accept this reality. If we're going to endure suffering and grow in the process, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that in this world, we truly are going to have trouble. doesn't mean that there aren't good things in the world, does it? There are wonderful things in this world. God has given us the, the, the joy of, of, of family and, 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 and the beautiful world that we live in. All sorts of things in this world that are good things, and yet all of that being enjoyed in the midst of suffering. And so we need to accept that suffering is a reality, continuing on, building on that. Today we're going to talk about the idea of maintaining a right perspective, how we think about our, our suffering and what's going on. It's another key to enduring suffering and overcoming. And then next week we'll talk about persevering in trusting God. These are the three keys. Accept, maintain, and persevere. What's the point? Although suffering is a reality, look, here's what Paul's telling us. It pales in comparison to the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's the point he's bringing out in this passage of Scripture. And, and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that God will help you to see that more clearly. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in here. We're in verse 18. Uh, we might think about that verse. The future glory is greater than present suffering. Look with me there at verse 18. Paul says, For I consider, that is after uh, thinking this through carefully, for I consider that the sufferings, and that's the sufferings, for Christ and the sufferings that just exist in this world. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy. The Greek word that he uses there gives you the idea that it's of no importance relative to what he's about to say. Uh, that the present sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Now that uh, word glory there in the Hebrew, uh, it, it means um, something that is heavy has a heaviness or a burden. It's something that is of great importance. He says, I, I, I consider that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, in Scripture, we're seeing a, a comparison being drawn here between sufferings and glory. But Paul makes this comparison in another place, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. He says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory. My word, that's rich language there he's bringing out there. An absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, so we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. He's basically saying here, the glory that God has promised is so much greater than what we're enduring here in this world that it, it takes our attention away from the suffering because of, of what God has promised to us. He says, for what is seen is temporary. It's the suffering. What is seen here in this life? It's temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Think about it like this. Imagine that you have a scale. And on one side of that scale, you put a feather. And on the other side of that scale, you, you take a, a full semi-truck load of gold. 53-foot trailer. Big trailer. 53-foot trailer. You put that on the other side. By the way, that, that much gold would actually cut, crush the truck because it's about four and a half million pounds of gold. That's what we're talking about. Feather on one side, all of this gold on the other side. Which is greater? Obviously, side with the gold. This is the point that Paul is bringing out here in this passage of Scripture. He says, compare it. Now, this is not to minimize the suffering that we go through, is it? I mean, we endure sometimes horrific things in this life. We recognize, and it's not to minimize it. That's not his point. But he's telling us, you have to consider the suffering of this life in its proper perspective, in relationship to the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's what he's talking about. Now, what is this glory? Well, there are at least three aspects spoken of in Scripture related to that glory, the glory to be revealed. First off, 
We see in Scripture God's glory revealed to believers. That's one aspect of what Paul's talking about here. God's glory is His magnificent beauty that comes from His from His character. And there will be a day when that is going to be revealed to us. Just a a small glimpse of what that means. John says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, "And, And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. Listen to this. For the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. My word, that's an incredible picture, isn't it? The, the, the brilliance, the magnificence of being in the presence of God is so extraordinary, you don't even need a light bulb. It lights up the, the whole place. He's just trying to give us an understanding here of, of what it is that, 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 that God has, has prepared for us. And one of these days, Christian, we've lived our life by faith, haven't we? Trusting God. But God tells us that one day our faith is going to become our sight. That the hands that were pierced, the feet that were pierced for our transgression, we'll see, we'll touch, we'll be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and so shall we ever be. Part of what Paul is talking about here in verse 18, this glory that is to be revealed to us is is talking about the glory of God that will be revealed to us. We look in Scripture, it's not the only glory that we see because we also see glory manifested in Christians. It's a part of what God has planned for us. John tells us, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. God's talking here about uh, the glorified body that we will receive. Uh, skip down in, in Romans 8 down to verse 30. He says there, uh, and, and these, speaking about Christians, and these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, look at this, He also glorified. Talking about what He's going to do. The good work that was started in you, Christian, is going to be brought to completion. And in part, that means that we are going to receive a glorified, resurrected body. That's a wonderful truth. We're thinking here about this this glory that is to be revealed. It's talking about God and His glory. It's talking about the glory manifested in Christians. In addition to this, the glorious restoration of creation is going to be better than it was before the fall. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. God is going to not simply restore creation, but things are going to be better than they ever were. My word, you think about the places that you've seen, the beautiful uh, places that you've seen in your lifetime. Keep in mind that all of the beauty in nature that we witness is a world under a curse. We haven't even seen God's handiwork yet. Because that curse will be taken away for eternity. We will enjoy this world as God had originally intended for us to with no thorns and no thistles, no death and no disease, no fear, no anxious feelings. God has a wonderful plan for us. Listen, this is at the heart of the prescription that that, that the Bible is giving to us so that we can endure and even grow in Christ in the midst of our suffering. It's to keep this in proper perspective because God isn't done. We haven't seen anything yet. God says, fix your eyes on the hope that we have, the eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus and what God is going to do and the way that He is going to renew this creation. Fill your heart with joy. Now, I think a natural question that flows out of that we need to deal with before we move on. 
When is this going to be? This sounds exciting, right? I'm ready today. <clears throat> Let me give you just a real quick run through. What are we talking about here? The, the glory to be revealed, by the way, that Paul is talking about is, is in the end times. So we have to skip forward to the, to the next event on the prophetic calendar. Talk about the, the rapture and the tribulation. Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, this great calling away of the believers. The reunification of those who have died in Christ, their body be, being glorified and reunited with their soul that is in heaven. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then the rest of us who are in the Lord, we will also rise and be united with our Lord in our glorified body. That's the next event on the prophetic calendar. Shortly after that rapture, the Bible talks about a time of tribulation. Daniel mentions it in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since the nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. He's talking about this seven-year period of, of tribulation on the earth when things will be worse than they have ever been at any other point. That will be brought to a conclusion with the physical reappearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we will accompany. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. I'm trying to paint for you the picture of this glory that is to be revealed. What is God talking about? Specifically, we're talking about when is this going to happen? And God has this prophetic timeline laid out. We have the rapture of the church. We have the seven-year tribulation period. Then we come into Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 29. We talk about what's often called the millennium. Verse 29 says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other, picturing this great and glorious return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every eye will see Him. And the angel said when Jesus went to heaven, He's going to return in the way that, that you saw Him go. This is what God has on the prophetic calendar. At that time, Satan will be confined uh, and, and uh, there will be a thousand year period of time that's characterized by peace and, and, and righteousness. It's also at this time, if you're wondering about the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham concerning the land, it's during that time uh, that that promise will be brought to fruition. Uh, then the Bible goes on to tell us that at the end of that thousand year period that Satan will be released from his confines and that he will lead a final uh, rebellion that will culminate in judgment. And then John talks about the final event. We're talking about this glory that is to be revealed. John talking about the final event in Revelation 21 and 22 when there are new heavens and new earth that will be established. This is what God has promised to us in the, in the future. And the point that, that Paul is making in this passage of Scripture, helping Christians to endure and even grow in Christ in the midst of, of the suffering that is in this world, Paul is saying, keep your eyes on this future glory. Keep your eyes on what it is that God is going to do. Allow it to fill your heart with, with joy and to strengthen you. So continuing on, Romans 8, 18-22 builds on that. Because God's plan for restoration involves all of creation. We're going to dig into the details of that now. Again, God's giving us this information because He wants us to understand that what He has promised to us is so much greater, so much glorious, uh, so more, much more glorious than anything that we could imagine. 
that, that in, in reflecting on this and trusting God based on what He said, that it would fill our hearts with joy, that it would strengthen us, even in the midst of suffering, to fix our eyes on what God has promised rather than to be fixated on the problem that we're enduring right now. And that's, that's really at the heart of how suffering overwhelms us, isn't it? When we think about this idea of suffering, there's, there's some problem that comes up in your life. You might think about it like this piece of paper. Some problem, trial, tribulation that comes up in your life and we, we begin to meditate on it, don't we? Look at it and just think about it. And, and the more we look at it, the more that this is all we see is that problem that's in our life. And the Bible is telling us here, stop fixating on the trouble and fix your eyes on the Savior, on the promise that God has given to us. This is how Christians are to live their lives, considering, thinking about what it is that God has promised to us and living in light of that by faith, trusting that what God has said He's going to do. And one of the things He's going to do is restore creation. Talked a little bit about that already. Let's dig in a little bit deeper. Because creation, actually, the Bible tells us, longs for this day. Look with me there at verse 19. Paul says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly. This has the idea of straining to see, looking, trying to, to, to see something off far in the distance. He says the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the, the revealing, for, for the sons of God to be revealed, reminding us, first off, that, that not everyone who claims to be a believer is a believer. That's, that's at the heart of that statement that he makes there. Jesus makes the same statement in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And, and, and Paul's making the statement that, that creation, all of creation longs to see when the true children of God are revealed. The Bible's personifying creation as it, as it pictures waiting, yearning for this, this event to happen, the revealing of the sons of God. Now, you hear that and you say, well, why is that? Why is, is that the focus? Well, that's going to be sort of the trigger point, you might say, to usher in the glorious freedom that God has promised to creation. When, when, all, when, the, when the sons of God are revealed, we know that at that point, God is, is going to uh, fulfill the promise that He made about making all things new. Look with me there at verse 20. It says, for creation. Now, uh, this is talking about all of creation. He says, for creation was subjected to futility. Paul talks, I'm sorry, Moses talks about this in, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. That's what he's talking about here when Adam rebelled against God and brought this curse upon the, the world. This is the futility that he's talking about there. Let me remind you of what Moses wrote in Genesis 3.17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The point that God is making there, this is not what He originally intended for creation or for His creatures that He created. But because of Adam's rebellion, he brought this curse into the world. And, and that's what he's talking about, that, that creation has been subjected to futility. That word means uselessness, in that it, creation has been unable to accomplish the purpose for which it was created. Creation's ability to, to be what God made it to be has been stopped or stifled. 
God says there's going to come a time when He's going to set creation free. Now, He goes on. He says this didn't happen willingly. Look with me there toward the middle of verse 20. Not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. He's talking there about God. Because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free. Now, that that statement there could be tidied up a little bit uh, to make it a little bit clearer in the English. That statement there, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free. Um, We could translate that in hope because the creation itself will also be set free. He's saying there, when God subjected all of creation to futility, He did so in hope, knowing what He had planned in the future. That's the point that that, that Paul is, is making there. So this is to say that at the revealing of the sons of God, creation is going to be set free from its slavery and its state of usefulness or uselessness. From its slavery to corruption. What we see there is that that creation has been in this state of bondage, degeneration, not functioning as God had originally intended, but going through this life cycle where something is born and it grows and then it begins to deteriorate and then ultimately it dies. And, 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 And the Bible is telling us this is not what God originally intended. And God's going to restore things so that this is not the way the world will will function. Rather, creation will be set free into the freedom. Look with me there at the middle of verse 21. Into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is the freedom from all the terrible things that creation has been subjected to. Creation longs for the revealing of the sons of God because creation was forced into this subjection of uselessness and desires to be made or to function as God originally intended. There, obviously, Paul is personifying creation, but just to try to, uh, to, to, to punctuate his point about how wrong things are in this world, and yet God is going to make all of it, not just new, but better than it was before. That's the point that he's, he's bringing out there. One last statement he makes here in verse 22, talking about this promised glory. And he says this promised glory makes suffering bittersweet. Again, the point that I'm bringing out to you here is that God tells us that we will endure and even grow in the midst of suffering as we maintain a right perspective. And that right perspective is fixing our eyes upon the glory that is to be revealed. He makes one last a statement here that, that, that again adds to the, this, this overall picture that we've been looking at. Giving us a, a godly perspective on where we are now contrasted against where God is going. Look with me at verse 22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians Verse five, I'm sorry, chapter five, verses two to four. This idea of, of creation groaning. He says, for indeed in this house we groan, speaking about being in our physical bodies. We ache, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Christians desiring to receive the fulfillment of the promise that God has given to us. We ache to see that promise fulfilled. Inasmuch as we have, uh, having put it on, we will not be found naked. What he's saying there is that, that, that you can know you've trusted God and you can know that the promise that He's given is going to be fulfilled. Verse 4, for indeed while we are in this tent, again this physical body, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that, we, so that what is mortal is swallowed up by life. He's painting this picture here of an intense longing for the glory to be revealed. Both believers as well as all of creation longing to see the promises that God has has made to us to see that come to fulfillment. Continuing on, look with me in the middle of verse 22. He says, "...and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now." One last little picture that he's giving to us. 
giving us this perspective again in the midst of our suffering, not to make light of it, not to say that it's insignificant, but to look at our suffering in light of what it is that God is going to do, in light of the promise that God has given to us. And Paul makes this last statement here as if to say it's sort of like childbirth. The statement shows the pain associated with childbirth, which is sort of a a pain that's worth it because of the result, because the child uh, that, that you have. You go through this process of childbirth and no one wants to go through it, but we go through it even with joy in our hearts, knowing that that the result is going to be the, the new child that comes into the world. And Paul says it's sort of like that. We go through the suffering that we endure in this life, almost as if having a child recognizing that, that there's something so much greater on the other side of this. When God brings to fruition what it is that, that He has has promised here the revealing of the sons of God when 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 God's glory is going to be manifest in this world when God's glory is going to be manifest in human beings and when God's glory is going to be manifest in creation Paul says you endure the suffering by by looking at it almost as if a a, a woman who is giving birth to a child enduring the pain and the difficulty of the moment eagerly anticipating the joy of the birth of that child. He's teaching us how to maintain and even thrive in the midst of suffering. We face trials and difficulties and struggles in this life. And God is telling us to accept the fact that in this world we do have trouble. And also to not forget about what it is that He's got planned for us. But that's so easy to do, isn't it? I mean, when you get get a a diagnosis from a doctor, or you get a phone call from a family member, or some trouble or difficulty comes in in your life, I think that that all of us, to varying degrees, there's this tendency for, for us to be gripped by fear, to begin to think about what could happen or what might happen or what's probably going to happen. What's likely to happen? All these things, we begin to fixate on this and focus our mind and our thinking on these things and it fills us with with anxiety and fear and, 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 and God is telling us, this is not how I want you to live your life. I want you to live your life in the midst of the trials that that you encounter in this world, in the midst of the suffering and and, and the trouble with your, your eyes on Christ, with your, your heart trusting in God and what it is that He's promised to us. How do we do that? I'd like for you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. How do we apply this to our lives? What do we do? So this isn't just theoretical. This idea of fixing our mind on the glory that is to be revealed. Paul tells us over here in Philippians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4 been talking about anxiousness. I'll I'll set the context here by backing up to verse 6. I want to look at verse 8. But Philippians chapter 4, Paul, he says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So he's telling us there, you're struggling with anxiousness. How do you respond? Well, don't just be overwhelmed by it. Understand that you can can take those thoughts captive. He says, come to God in prayer. That's a prayer of faith. It's not just throwing up prayers to God randomly, but a prayer of faith with supplication. That is, make your requests known to God. And he says, um, with thanksgiving. The idea of thanksgiving, what are you, you're, you're looking back over your shoulder at what God has done for you in the past. You're being reminded of the way that God has worked in your life in the past. So you're taking your problem to God. You're being reminded of what God has done for you in the past. And you're trusting Him by faith to do something in your life. And as that happens, look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is, you're trusting God and being reminded and celebrating what God has done in the past, that it will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. But going on from that, Thinking about the suffering and the trouble and the trials. How how do we do this? What do we do? Look what he says. He gives us a a filter. Verse 8, I think of as a 
filter for our thoughts. Filter all your thoughts through this. He says, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Paul is teaching us here that, that we are to examine our thought life, especially in the midst of suffering and trials and difficulties, and ask these questions. Are the things that I'm thinking about, are, are these things true? Are they honorable? Are they right? Or am I speculating about what might happen or what could happen? Am I focusing my mind on the truth, not only of my circumstances, but the truth of who God is and the truth of what God has planned. He's, he's telling us that, that our thinking needs to come in line with the thinking of God, similar to what he says over in Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 23, where he tells us that we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Our thinking needs to come in line with the thinking of, of, of God. So what he's telling us here, how do you apply this to your life First, you have to take those thoughts captive. And listen, in the midst of, of trials and difficulties and suffering, that can be overwhelming, can't it? You may need to, to, to make some sort of reminder. Maybe put in your phone, uh, Philippians 4.8, have an alarm go off every couple of hours to remind you to go. You, you, you'll laugh. But if you've struggled with, with serious anxiousness over something that's going on, you, you need to be snapped out of that. And so what you're doing is you're training your mind to come back and to think God's thoughts and to say, wait a minute, hold on. What's true about this? What, what's true about my circumstances? What's true about God? What's true about what He said about me and, and the, the future that He's promised? What's true about this? And, and that as you do this, that it's going to begin to work in your heart and your mind because now you're going to look at your circumstances and the trouble that you have in life in a proper perspective. Yes, it's still there in light of who God is and in light of what He's doing in this world and in light of everything else. Do you see how in the midst of this, it, it, it helps to, 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 to guard your heart from being overwhelmed by those anxious thinking? By anxious thinking. This is what He calls us to do, to live and to respond to the, the suffering and the trouble of life in light of who God is and what it is that He has planned for you. And in this, the Holy Spirit is working in your heart to give you peace and joy and contentment, even in the midst of a trial. Now, listen, if you are an unbeliever, you need to know that this is not true of you. If you are ne have never repented of your sin and believed Jesus, the Bible says that what awaits you is condemnation and separation from God for all of eternity. But in Christ, if you will repent, God says He'll forgive you and He'll welcome you into His family. And these promises will belong to you as well. That's a glorious promise God's given to us. I trust that the teaching of God's Word was a ministry to you today. Uh, again, I want to invite you to come out to our services at 645 on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday morning for our worship at 1030. In addition to that, we have a variety of opportunities and activities throughout the week to minister to both children and adults. You can find out more information on our website. God bless. I hope you have a great day.